Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us at Energize Your Lunch. Welcome to you all. We've got a great... The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us at Energize Your Lunch. Welcome to you all. We've got a great diverse group here today from Roanoke County, Virginia to Pima County, Arizona. The group includes local code practitioners, state and regional policy officials, home builders, architects, and manufacturers. My name is Michelle Britt, and today we'll be talking about hot topics for additions and alterations in the 2012 IECC. Our goal is to increase compliance with the Energy Code through education. We know your time is valuable, and we hope the information and resources we discuss today will be equally as valuable. Now, before we get started, I need to mention that several products and product manufacturers' names are shown in the presentation. These are for educational purposes only, and there's no implied product endorsement by Britt Mackler Group. If you have any questions during the presentation, please use the chat function at the right-hand side of your screen. Just type in your question, and we'll have two Q&As during the presentation. With that, let me introduce the presenter today, Eric Makala. Many of you know Eric. He has over 25 years of experience leading building energy efficiency and building code efforts across the country. Eric? Thank you, Michelle, and welcome everyone to our second Energizer Lunch in a, a fairly long series. Hopefully all of you um, saw the series, uh, series the, the additional ones coming up in the next number of months. So we have them scheduled right now all the way through June. So please feel free if you uh, to go and register. Um, again, these are free, free sessions, and um, hopefully they'll be of, of benefit to you. So what are we going to talk about today? Today we're going to be focused on the residential additions and alterations for the 2012 International Energy Conservation Code. Unfortunately, from a code standpoint, the requirements in the code that deal with these are um, about as clear as mud in some cases. So there's a couple of paragraphs at the very beginning of Chapter 1 of the 2012 IECC that essentially says what must comply with additions and alterations, but really not a lot of guidance um, to tell you how you would really need to, uh, to deal with this. So, so what our goal is today is to try to clarify as much as possible what's in the code um, as we go through it. And we'll start with additions first. We'll stop for a uh, question and answer after the addition section, and then we'll get into alterations, and we'll go ahead and um, we'll go ahead and have a QA after that, and then we'll wrap up the seminar and we'll hopefully have you out of here um, through your lunch time, which should be uh, hopefully about one hour. So, with that, let's go ahead and start with the poll question first. And the first poll question for additions and alterations. Having a little trouble, okay, with this one. So the first poll question, uh, must the whole house comply with the code if I'm adding an addition onto the house? So I'll give you a few minutes to answer here, and then we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and dig into the content. So right now we've got about roughly 75% of you have voted. We'll give you just a few more seconds if you want to put your vote in before I, uh, before I close it. All right, so I'll go ahead and close the poll and share the results with you. And as you can see, um, all of you got the answer right that not the entire building has to comply with the code. Um, so let's go ahead now and start digging into the presentation. And make sure that you can actually see what I'm going to be showing on here. OK, with that, let's move into additions. So from an addition standpoint, the 2012 IECC, and we're going to be focused on the 2012 because really the requirements haven't changed between the 2009 and 2012 for, for residential. Um, 
the additions and alterations requirements for the code and additions, alterations, and repairs, um, we will go in and define what an addition is and then also what an alteration and repair are, just to make sure you're clear on that. That will happen in the next couple of slides. Uh, but essentially, additions always have to comply with building envelope requirements, the heating and cooling system requirements, service water heating, but maybe service water heating, depending on what, what kind of an addition it is, and maybe lighting requirements. But typically, your building envelope and heating and cooling systems will be the two that will always need to uh, comply with the code, because you're always going to be putting some type of heating system out into your addition. Um, that could be more duct work. That could be its own separate mechanical system. Um, so, but that will typically always need to, need to comply. For alterations and repairs, though, it really depends on what you're doing to the project. Um, and we'll describe this a little bit later. So, but the way the code is, the works right now, if you're not touching something, it doesn't have to comply with the code. So it really, your alterations are entirely dependent on what you're doing and to the energy using system in the building, and this is the key aspect of it. And your energy using key, uh, energy using systems of the building would be your building envelope, your mechanical system, service water heating system, or your lighting system. So some of the key terms we need to take a look at. Um, one is what, an, what we're actually talking about when we use the term addition. So from this slide, it's an extension or increase in the conditions, space, floor area, or height of a building or structure. When we talk about condition space, this is the area you're heating or cooling. And the code is fairly specific on what is conditioned. It basically says if you have space conditioning equipment, in your building, it must comply with the code uh, for the envelope requirements. Um, this doesn't, this, it doesn't matter how hot you're heating that space or how cold you're cooling that space. Any space conditioning system will trigger the code from a code standpoint. Um, so a new attached addition has to comply with the code. Changing an existing space that might be previously unconditioned to a conditioned space, for example, converting a garage into a family room, which is a, a common and popular thing to do, would, would actually trigger the code, and that would be cons considered an addition. So from an addition standpoint, again, these are the types of things you have to watch out for. Alterations are a little bit murkier. Um, so the code basically says any construction or renovation to an existing structure other than repair or addition that requires a permit. And this is a key thing that requires a permit. Um, I think we all know that obviously sometimes even though things require a permit, people may not get them, but um, they, they still require the permit. So, um, so this could be a change to a mechanical system. Maybe I'm adding a heat pump uh, to condition some of those hard to condition rooms that are over garages that we commonly here on the West Coast call bonus rooms. Um, if I'm adding something, that would be a condi uh, considered an alteration. If I'm putting in more lighting in a bathroom or, or, or redoing my, my bathroom and putting lighting in there, that would be considered an alteration of the lighting system. Um, so also if I'm adding windows to the house, uh, that would be considered an alteration. So these are all things that we would we consider alterations. So then the last term we're going to take a look at is the term repair. And I'm not going to be talking about renovations. The term renovation is used in the code, but it's not defined in the code. So, so we'll take a look at what a repair is. And essentially, a repair is um, either, either fixing things that are broken. For example, I'm replacing my furnace because my furnace just broke down, or I'm replacing my air conditioner because my air conditioner broke down. But these are things that are considered repairs. And typically, they're, they're things that some jurisdictions may require permits. Others may not require permits. It really depends on the jurisdiction. Um, in this particular example, they're replacing um, some of the floor joists and, and siding and things that have been rotted out. And that would be considered a repair. Um, and again, each jurisdiction is a little bit different on if they'll require a permit or not. This one looks pretty extensive based on the picture. So, so repairs, we're not going to get too much into repairs today. But if you have questions on those, uh, please, please feel free to fire away, and I'll try to I'll try to get those answered. So let's get into additions themselves. Um, first example is just adding on a room. You're adding on existing or a, a, a brand new space. It almost looks like a self-contained unit that's got walls, floors, uh, roof ceiling assembly, windows, and potentially doors. 
The next one is a garage conversion, and this has uh, become very common, especially as um, the housing market has started to um, to go down. People like to convert uh, usable space into to real usable space that might not be un, um, conditioned into conditioned spaces like family rooms. So in this case, your garage would have to comply with the code. That would be the um, anything that your your walls, your windows, your your roof assembly, uh, the slab edge on that. So if you looked at this particular example. Oh, let me pull out my highlighter here. We have a slab edge. Whoops! That would go back into this space where the garage, where the parking, um, where the parking slab is. So it would wrap around there on both sides and it go all the way back. That's considered slab on grade, and that technically has to be insulated to get it to comply with the code. So, um, so yeah, these are these are not the easiest to comply, but we'll take a look at uh, some potential ways of getting them to work. And then the last but not least, let me go back one slide. I apologize for having a, a little technical difficulty here. Uh, would be um, converting a previously unconditioned basement into a conditioned basement. Um, so we, we buy a house, and the basement is unfinished and unconditioned, assuming that the homeowner is going to go ahead and finish it out later on. Um, and so if there's no ductwork going down there, it's truly an unconditioned space. If you now condition that space, you would have to comply with the energy code, and therefore um, your basement walls would have to comply, the insulation or um, your glazing would have to comply. Um, so you'd have to do air sealing and things like that to get this to work from an energy code standpoint. Okay, so these are prime examples. Now let's take a look at kind of a, a messy flow chart here, if you will, of things that would need to you'd need to do to get the building to comply with the energy code for additions and um, for additions. So there's two processes that you can actually use for compliance for additions. Um, the first one is prescriptive compliance. And this is the easiest method for comply with the code. Um, so essentially, you put in the right R values of insulation. You do all your air sealing. You make sure your mechanical system complies and your water heating system complies, and everything prescriptive is. And there's really no trade-off. Within prescriptive, though, there is the possibility of doing a res check run, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. If you have a very difficult to comply addition, you might try simulate a performance alternative, and this is essentially modeling the building. Um, Modeling the, the building's energy use and trying to show that the building's um, the building's energy use or actually energy cost complies with the code. So this allows significantly more trade-offs, and it might be an option for those very difficult to comply additions. Within both the prescriptive compliance and the simulated performance approach, you still have to comply with the, the mandatory requirement boxes. So these are these are shaded a different color. Um, so even going simulated performance, there are mandatory things that you have to comply with. Um, for example, in the heating and cooling system, you um, you have to put in um, setback controls. You may have to put in a mechanical system piping based on the type of system you're putting in. You also have equipment sizing that would need to comply with the code. So you'd have to go ahead and size your equipment using ACA Manual J. Um, you also have on the envelope side a minimum. Uh, minimum or maximum air leakage requirements, so your, your building can only be so leaky. So those will always apply for simulated performance. Under prescriptive, all of these would comply, um, the gray boxes and the, um, the other boxes, um, including lighting equipment, service hot water, and that type of thing. So they would all comply underneath the prescriptive requirements. The key thing is that whatever's new in your addition must comply with the code, but the code is not retroactive. For example, if I have an existing mechanical system that will has enough capacity to heat my addition without putting in a new mechanical system, and all I'm doing is running ductwork over to that new mechanic, the new addition, I don't have to bring up my my furnace um, to comply with the code. Only my whatever's new, so only my new ductwork would have, in this case, would have to be sealed and would have to be insulated. So this is a key critical key critical thing to remember as you're working through additions. Okay, let me get to the next slide here. So if we're looking for from a prescriptive standpoint, um, the easiest way to do it is to go through the prescriptive R value table in the code. So if I 
if I do, uh, if I'm building a house in climate zone five, for example, I would comply with the fenestration U factor requirements for all of my glazing, which would be a 0.35. My sky, if I have skylights, I'll comply with the 0.60. Um, there are no um, solar heat gain coefficient requirements in climate zone five, so I don't worry about that. My new ceiling would be an R38. Uh, my walls would be an R20 or an R13 plus five. Um, my mass walls would be an R13 or an R17. So essentially, I'd work my way across this table and comply with the code that way. And as I'm looking at this table, I want to apologize for everyone because I think I'm putting up the requirements for the 2009 IECC and not the 2000. 12 IECC. This R49 would actually, this R38 right here would actually be an R49 underneath the new requirements. So anyway, but I think you can get the point that if I comply with the requirements for all the applicable features on the building, I comply with the energy code. And that's kind of the key thing we're looking at. So this, again, is a bit, the easiest way to do it. It doesn't work for all approaches. For example, if I have a garage conversion, um, this would require me to insulate my slab edge of that garage. So this was, um, this has been a difficult issue for, for garages on how to get them to comply with the code. So this may not work for everything, but it will work for um, some type of additions, fairly simple additions. The other option you have would be to go to the U-factor table, which is the corresponding glazing U or, um, um, envelope U-factor table. So if I have a, um, assemblies that I want slightly, try to get slightly more credit um, from a thermal standpoint, I can comply with the, the U factors, the corresponding U factors. So for example, my, um, my R20 wall in this particular case would be cons uh, the same as a, 0 .5, a 0 .057 U factor wall system. And um, I can add more to that wall system to try to increase, to try to increase the efficiencies because the R value table is only for insulation R value, not for um, and that's all you, all you focus on. So you can add additional insulation to that, or you can beef up the wall using other types of materials to try to meet the 0.057 U factor requirement. So that's, that's always an option. Um, oftentimes it's not used, but certainly it's always an option. The other option you have is to do a res check run, or in the code, it's a UA approach. And this, this could be very common, a lot of jurisdictions like this, but you can essentially trade off trade off insulation levels um, within that assembly or, or glazing U factors, uh, different levels of efficiency to try to get the, to comply with the code. This particular res check run is from an addition we'll talk about a little bit later for our family home and the Brit, new Britt Makala offices that we're building right, or that we're, we're converting an old house, and we'll take a look at that later. But you can see that I've complied with the code by 2.2% better than code, which is not great, um, but it does point out that we'll talk about a little bit later some of the problems and issues we had getting it to, to that point, just to make sure we had the, the adequate space that we wanted. But a, certainly going with a res check for the addition by itself would be a very easy thing to, um, very easy thing to use to comply with the energy code and allow you some trade-offs you can't get going from the prescriptive requirement. Taking a look at fenestration, the fenestration requirements for additions, there's a couple of different options you have. Um, one is you have to meet the U-factor requirement in the code. There is also a U-factor exemption that basically allows you to exempt up to 15 square feet of glazing uh, for an addition. So, so anyway, I need to... Um, I need to be able to, um, I, if I have a special piece of glazing, um, some type of a stained glass window and things like that, and I can't quite meet the U-factor requirement for the code, I can go ahead and, and do that. Um, glaze fenestration, solar heat gain coefficient. Um, if I'm in climate zone one, two, or three, I will have SHGC requirements to comply with, with the code. I can exempt, in this case again, up to 15 square feet of glass, and that would, um, to make sure that if, it, uh, so, so if I have, again, the special piece of window, stained glass, or whatever I'm doing, I can go ahead and exempt that. Um, opaque door exemption, I'm allowed to exempt up to 24 squ square feet of side hinge or side swinging door. So if I have a door, uh, maybe a, a, a very a wood ornate door that may not have a, the U-factor that I'm looking for um, going out of my addition, I can exempt that. 
And interestingly enough, the, the old code and I've, um, basically just said you could exempt one door. And so theoretically, I could go into a garage, not change out. I could heat the garage layout without changing out the garage door. And uh, my, the large roll-up door where you drive your car through and basically exempt that entire exempt that entire door. So the 2012 code, this was modified to say 24 square feet of side swinging door to make it clear what, what type of door that was being looked at. There's also a sunroom U-factor exemption here too. And a sunroom is any room that's greater than 40% glass to wall area for both, or glass area for both the walls and also the roof. Um, the u -fact, so you can actually install the U-factor in climate zone four through eight of uh, less than or equal to 0.45, which is, um, better than the 0.32 U-factor currently required by code. So air leakage and testing requirements. This is one that's an interesting one because of the 2009 code, the air leakage requirements were, were voluntary for testing. And the 2012 code, they are now mandatory for testing. Um, we're waiting to see how this is going to work on, um, how this is going to work on primarily or work out primarily because if you look at option A, the addition is closed off from the rest of the house, and there's a there's a there's a closable door in this in this case. And you also have a partition separating the addition from the existing house. To be honest, I'm not sure from a testing standpoint, and those of you that might be more in the know on this, um, if my addition is basically a room off the existing house, this is showing an option B, and there's no partition between the existing building and the addition. That one I'm not sure how it's going to work. You'll have to somehow block this off to be able to test this. Um, now, certainly a jurisdiction could give a variance on, on this type of an addition to basically say just comply with the uh, insulation and air sealing uh, table within the code. Um, but that would be up to the jurisdiction on how to do that. Um, right now, I don't know that ICC has a interpretation out on this yet because I'm not sure that it's actually actually come to their attention that this could be a potential issue from a code standpoint. But this is something just to uh, just to keep you aware of as you're um, dealing with these types of projects. For heating and cooling system. Um, Essentially, any time you put ductwork in unconditioned space, you must test the ductwork. And this is kind of a, a key critical thing. It doesn't, right now, the current code doesn't tell you how long the ductwork must be. It essentially just says if, it, if ductwork is in an unconditioned space, it must be sealed. So, the, um, so your ductwork has to be sealed. You'll also have to insulate your ductwork if it's in unconditioned space. If it's in conditioned space, you don't worry about it. You, if you're putting in a new system, you may have to put in mechanical controls too. Uh, well, you will always have to put in HVAC controls. And then there, if you're putting in a condensing unit on the outside, a new air conditioning system and running lines to the coil and the furnace, then you'd also have to go ahead and make sure you insulate the piping insulation, the mechanical piping insulation. So these are kind of the key critical things. But again, if you're not doing this and all you're doing is running new ductwork from the existing condition, existing furnace to a new addition, then only that ductwork has to comply. So again, it's whatever is new has to comply with the energy code. So an example, um, the, the top example here shows a duct in conditioned space that they're adding. Here's the existing building, the addition. You have your forced air unit in the existing section, and you're only running a new piece of ductwork over to the addition. And maybe this is a, an attached garage with a bonus room over the top of that. Um, there would be no requirements for that duct other than it be sealed to meet the um, air sealing, the, the duct sealing requirements, but it would not have to be tested. But on the bottom example, you're sort of showing ductwork, new ductwork running into unconditioned space, and therefore that new ductwork would have to be tested and insulated per the IECC. Hot water systems, uh, there's lots of new requirements in the 2012 IECC for the residential provisions that require you to insulate hot water piping. You would have to, in this case, make sure that um, you comply with those requirements if you're, if you're replumbing your system. For example, the, the house that we're working on right now, the, reno, the renovation I'll show you shortly, we're putting in a new, a new PEC system. Um, and so we'll have to make sure if we're doing it underneath the 2000 um, 9 or 12 code to make sure all of our hot water lines are, are insulated per the requirements of the code. 
The other requirement you have to deal with is if you're putting in a circulation pump or circulation system, you'll have to make sure you put the appropriate controls, either manual or automatic controls, onto the pump to make sure that it's, uh, you can turn the pump off when, when no one's in the house to make sure you're not circulating hot water through the, the, the home 24 hours a day when, when no one is there to use it. For lighting equipment, if you're adding on a bathroom or adding on a kitchen, for example, or adding on any room where you're going to have connected load, this could be a family room, that type of thing, you have to, com you have to comply with the requirement for high efficacy lighting, which means 75% of the lights um, 75% of the lights have to be high efficacy lighting of the connected loads or connected lights. So high efficacy is typically going to translate into a compact fluorescent or some type of fluorescent tubing, um, or it could be an LED light for that matter too. So LED, the, the, the efficacies are, are fairly high on those. So the key thing, though, is to make sure that um, you account for this when you're doing your addition to make sure that, again, 75% of these are high efficacy lighting. So with that, these are the prime requirements of the code. Let's take a look at a case study right now. And I'll walk you through the, um, the home that we're currently working on right now. This house was uh, built in 1900. Um, this will be our new family house and also will house the offices of Britt Macula Group. And what we're calling phase one is the basement conversion, which you saw an earlier slide on. The basement currently right now, um, this is the current state of the basement, so it's, um, it's in, in con deconstruction mode if you want to look at it that way. The things that we're looking at doing in this basement from this picture, and let me grab my pointer, we are going to um, take the water heater and boiler that's cur that are currently located in the center of the, in the, center of the, um, the basement and move those, um, and I'll show you a show you a detailed plan of where those are going to go. So we're actually replacing the, um, the old, actually it's an 18-year-old boiler, replacing that with a condensing boiler uh, with a 90% uh, plus boiler. So that will require a load calculation, a manual J load calculation, and it will also require a permit to, to move that too. Um, any of our lines going from the boiler to the heating system, technically those, are, those must be insulated. Even though they're in condition space, the, the, you'll have to insulate the piping. Uh, those are HVAC piping. The water heater will be replaced, too, so the water heater will also have to comply with the new NACA um, water heating requirements. Uh, the water heater will just be run off of the boiler. Um, so, and then any hot water lines under the 2012 going to that water heater will typically have to be insulated to an R3. In this case, you can see the walls. Uh, the walls will be insulated. They're currently uninsulated. And this is previously unconditioned space. So the walls will be insulated um, to an R18 total. We'll go ahead and put in an R5 foam board insulation and then frame out with 2x4 stud wall and install R13 insulation between that. The ceiling of this is a uh, space. This is a, um, an assembly between two condition spaces because we have our, our condition space up above that. We don't have to worry about that. But the glazing on here, there are six windows that go around that you'll see on the plan. Those will all be replaced, one for egress to make sure we can actually exit the, uh, make it safe for bedrooms down in the basement, and also we'll make sure that it complies with the 0.32 U-factor window. Um, now we are increasing glass, and from an addition standpoint, this isn't an issue because remember you're allowed unlimited glass area underneath the residential provisions of the code. So technically, I can put as much glass in here as I want. Um, we're not going to. Uh, we will be enlarging the current windows we have down here to make sure we have plenty of, of good uh, daylight coming down into the basement to try to, to try to lighten this as best as possible. The other thing we're doing on this basement, um, let me grab my pointer back, is we're also concerned about head height. Actually, I guess I should say I'm concerned about head height. Uh, those of you that don't know me, I'm 6'7". And the head height, the, the, the maximum floor height we're going to get from the floor to the bottom of the floor joist is 6 feet 9 and a half inches. So we will be going through and taking out anything that hangs below the floor joist level and trying to move them up into the floor joist themselves. So this is, this is a, definitely a, a challenge and constraint that we're looking at. Um, also, as we're going through this remodel, there are other non-energy related issues you have to deal with. For example, asbestos, the black area on the floor where the carpet's torn up. Um, we, we did have this tested, and it does test for a, a small amount of asbestos that we have, to, we have to go ahead and dispose of in a proper manner. 
So these are some of the types of things you might run into that are not necessarily energy related, but, but are things that you have to have to deal with. So um, other than that, we also had the house tested for radon, and we're at uh, about 2.5 rads. And we are going to actually put in a uh, radon mitigation system in this in some of the areas, because as soon as we seal up the house, we, we expect the radon levels to go up. Um, so these are some of the, again, some of the areas we're, we're taking a look at. From a floor, um, floor plan standpoint, this will be the floor plan of the basement. And you can see the new, um, new location of the boiler water heater. So again, this will all be code compliant. We'll insulate our walls all the way around. And we'll also go ahead and replace all of the windows um, with essentially 0.32 U-factor glass. We're not worried about the solar heat gain coefficient on this, primarily because these the windows are fairly well shaded. And they'll, they'll already come with a, a fairly good U-factor. We're also going to be putting in, um, putting in uh, code compliant stairs, because right now the stairs are about two feet wide. So we need to increase that. Um, new bathroom area down here, this will require, we'll have, we will have connected lights. And we will have to go ahead and um, put in, make sure that 75% of the lights in this space, and actually all the connected lights down here in the basement are high efficacy lighting. So um, while this coat, while this house is built underneath the, uh, the, the current jurisdiction we're in is actually under the 2009 code, we're trying to comply with the 2012 code as, as much as possible for the mandatory requirements. The res check run that we did on this house um, we complied by 2.2% better than code. Um, we wanted to do better than that, but again, this is a prescriptive U-factor UA approach. It doesn't account for the fact that we're putting in a high, um, a high efficiency boiler. It doesn't account for all the air sealing we're doing down in the basement, too. Um, so there will be, um, we tested the entire house, and right now the house tests out at eight, changes, eight air changes per hour with the, the current state of the basement. So once we seal that up, we should actually get the house uh, significantly tighter. But you can see some of the things we're doing. For example, our, our windows will be 0.32 windows. Um, our basement walls, this is the, the um, basement walls are going to be an R5 plus an R13, which is what we talked about. So R5 continuous plus an R13 between framing. We do have some in areas that, um, for our basement walls that are very difficult to insulate. And we're actually only putting an R7.5 in on that uh, between furring, um, only because this is going to take up a lot of space and it's going to it could impact our, with the way our stairs run. So we were able to get it to comply without uh, without insulation, but it does show you that the insulation levels here are higher than code for the 2009 code. But still, even with that, we were only get this to comply with the um, with a 2.2% uh, um, compliance margin. OK, with that, there's a couple of, a couple of uh, resources I'd like to show you. And the first one, this is, um, since we're talking about, there we go, making sure, since we're talking about converting unconditioned basements to conditioned space, the US Department of Energy Building Energy Codes program developed a uh, code notes on based on the 2009 code on how to how you could convert a basement to comply with the code. Uh, this is free from the, and we'll have a, the, a slide with the resources on it. Um, it'll talk about a background, the applications, and provide some guidance on how to do this in different ways to actually get a basement to comply with the energy code. And then this would be going from an unconditioned basement to a conditioned basement. So the next one I want to take a look at here briefly is the um, a code notes on converting an unconditioned garage to conditioned space. And again, this has been a, a problem area primarily because a lot of garages, especially in cold climates, are framed with two by four walls with no slab edge, slab edge insulation. And now you're trying to, to um, you're required by the 2012 code in uh, climate zones five and up for, for the most part to, to put in either um, cavity insulation plus um, plus continuous insulation or uh, frame with two by six walls and then also put in continuous over the top of that. So it makes garages fairly fairly difficult to comply with from an energy code standpoint. It's easy to put insulation up in the attic um, 
but it's difficult to insulate the walls in some cases, except if you're in hot climates and you're only required to have an R13. And the other op the other issue you could potentially have again is your slab edge insulation because most most of these are not built with um, are not built with slab edge. So you would need to in the 2009 code, for example, put at least an R2 or an R10 insulation down two feet on the slab edge to get that to comply with the code. Um, so again, it becomes problematic and difficult for these types of, of structures to to comply. So. Anyway, um, that is it, I believe, on additions. Let's go, let me go back to the presentation here, and we will uh, So the, the references are here. Again, it's the energycodes.gov website. Energycodes.gov is where the website is to be able to get into all of the code notes. Great resources, and they are, um, they are free. So with that. Let's go ahead and stop, and we'll take some questions. Um, so the first question, and I knew this was going to be coming, R305.1 minimum height in habitable basement requires not less than seven feet ceiling height. And believe me, I, I dug, we dug into that, and we actually talked to the jurisdiction. Um, it, it is it is a potential issue. We are finishing it out. The jurisdiction um, realized that there's a lot of old homes in the Boise market, and if they put that type of constraint on finishing out basements, it could be uh, it could be a real issue. Um, again, we're doing everything we can to to maximize the ceiling height, um, but we we are definitely uh, definitely aware of of that constraint, and that was one thing that uh, we we had to think long and hard on before we we purchased the house. Um, so anyway, if there's anyone has any else other questions, we have a couple of other questions here that I'll go ahead and, and answer. Is there any allowance for reduced insulation levels and framing that can't hold the required R value? And this is a great question, primarily because we talked about the we went ahead and talked about the um, a garage conversion and a garage insulation conversion. And from that standpoint, um, if, if the garage is, is framed with two by six con or two by four construction, and you're actually required to have two by sixes um, with with the proper insulation level in there, that could be a fairly costly conversion. Um, right now, um, there are no there's nothing in the code that allows that to happen. The only thing you can do is try to trade that off, but it's a very a very uh, difficult thing to trade off. I, I know some jurisdictions give variances for these types of things, much like the seven foot head height. Um, but in general, there's no variances for this, and there's 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 nothing in the code that basically this um, requires you to put in less insulation. And I'm not I as far as I know from future code change proposals, I don't think anything's coming down the line that will allow that in in the future codes, um, unfortunately. Um, so the other question is is can I put an all glass addition onto my house and still comply with the energy code? Absolutely. Um, the code has unlimited glass area right now, so if I wanted to uh, put an all-glass addition on, uh, there's two ways I could do it. One, if it is truly a sun porch or sun room, I, could, um, I can get, follow the sun room requirements, which is for um, spaces with greater than or equal to 40% of the gross roof and wall area in glass. And in that case, I'd be actually be allowed to put in a 0.45 U factor, or I can comply just with the prescriptive requirements and have all my glass with a, a 0.32 U factor. So I tend to err on efficiencies, so I would probably try to, to get the, the most efficient glass you can, you can do on that and try to go with the 0.32. The next uh, question that comes in is regarding blower door on an addition they can use the whole house option for one measure. Yes, you could actually you could actually test the entire house with that addition. Uh, we showed the example of the addition that was open to the, the house with no no separation between spaces, and you could go ahead and test the entire house. Uh, depending on where you were, if you're in a, a hot climate, um, you would you would be able to test the five air changes per hour, or if you're in a cold climate, you'd have to comply with the three air changes per hour. But certainly that is that, that that can be done. So you can comply with the entire building. And and the one thing I didn't mention, um, I'm not sure that I mentioned on um, in an earlier slides is you don't have to make the addition compliant on its own. You can always bring up the entire house to compliance with the energy code. And there might be some reasons why you would want to do that. Um, so your options are either to comply just with the addition by itself or to comply with the entire the entire uh, building. So that is certainly uh, certainly. Um, and that would make the, doing a, a, a narrow leakage test on the space um, definitely a relevant thing to do. So 
I'm looking, I'm right now I'm not seeing any other questions coming in. So we're going to go ahead and jump to a poll question and get into the alterations portion of the section. So let me, uh, let me throw a poll question up here and we'll see how you all do on this one. So the poll question is, if I add a small section of ductwork into an unconditioned attic, must the new ductwork be air leakage tested? So if I put a small section of ductwork up into the attic, do I have to air leakage test it? So we have a group that's very well versed on the 2012 code, which is, which is great, or the 2009 code for that matter. Okay, we'll give a give another 15 seconds here to uh, for you for you to vote, and then we'll go ahead and close the poll, and I'll share you share the results with you. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close it, and I'll share the results with you. And absolutely, if if you put a small section of ductwork up in the attic and it's an unconditioned space, there's the code does require you to go ahead and in, uh, to go ahead and do air leakage testing on, on that piece on, on the ducting. So that's a uh, that's a key critical thing in the code. Um, Sometimes we've had lots of questions on that, but that is one of the requirements in the code. So with that, let's go ahead and get back into our PowerPoint and go ahead and dig into alterations. So. First slide we're looking at right here, um, very common on alteration could be a window replacement. So I'm taking out an existing window and replacing it with a, um, with a, um, a window that complies with the code. Um, the duct replacement addition, this is another one. And this is, this is uh, I'm, I'm hoping that none of you ever run into a duct system like this, but this is, this is ducts gone wild. So, um, but this might be someone wanting to add a, a second floor on or something like that, and they're actually, or they're ripped out all the old duct and put in new duct. But but this, this if this were new, a new ducting, this would all have to comply with the uh, comply with the energy code. So from an additions and alterations and repair standpoint, we're talking about a, an alteration right now, and the alterations flow chart, if you will, looks very similar to what we just looked at for addition. So here's our alterations and repairs, and you can kind of follow the line down. And the way alterations work is whatever you alter must comply with the energy code. So if I'm altering the envelope, for example, I'm going to have to, to apply with the applicable requirements for the energy code. If I'm altering the heating or cooling system, let's say an alteration could be adding a mechanical system to a space. So I'm not adding condition space. I'm adding another piece of equipment to a space that's already heated and cooled. I would have to comply with the lighting controls requirement or the uh, mechanical controls requirement for a setback thermostat. I'm going to go ahead and have to, to insulate my piping. I'm going to have to go ahead and size my system based on ACA Manual J. I need to insulate my ductwork and seal my ductwork and potentially do air leakage testing on my ductwork based on um, based on where that piece of duct is located. So if I'm putting in a new a, a water heater or an additional water heater. I'm going to have to make sure I comply with the circulating hot water system requirements or the water heating, um, the hot water line uh, insulation requirements. Lighting, we've talked about a little bit before, but I need to go ahead and comply with the lighting requirements too for any kind of an alteration to that. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that one as we go through. So from a building envelope standpoint, for alterations, there are some exemptions to the code that we'll go through. First one is storm windows installed over existing fenestration. You're not replacing anything. All you're doing is installing a storm window over the, the, the existing window. You're actually making it better. Um, so that would be exempt from the code. Uh, glass only replacements. If someone throws a baseball or a rock through your window and you're just replacing the glass and not replacing the entire window unit, that, that is exempt from the code. Um, existing ceiling wall or floor cavities exposed during construction provided that these cavities are filled with insulation. So if I take off the sheetrock of a, a house I'm, I'm working on and the cavity is completely filled with insulation, even though the insulation may not comply with the current code requirements, 
it still complies with the energy code. I'm not required to add additional insulation into that. Construction where existing roof, wall, or floor cavity is not exposed. So if I'm doing something and I don't expose anything, um, then I don't worry about that. Um, and last but not least, which has been a point of a lot of um, consternation, for, uh, is re-roofing for roofs where neither the sheathing nor the insulation is exposed. And this actually takes some digging into, which we will here in a couple of slides, but basically what this is saying that if I, if I take off my, my roof covering, so my shingles, whether they're comp shingles, wood shingles, whatever they are, um, and I don't expose anything, then I can put I can re-roof my house without having to insulate the, the attic assembly. And this has been under a lot of review by the Code Action Committee by ICC, and there will be some new requirements being proposed to the 2015 IECC to try to clarify this particular provision, but we will take a look at this in a in a few minutes. Um, the envelope alteration existing, uh, if, if I'm adding if I'm adding glass, so in this case I'm putting on a skylight or I'm putting in new windows, uh, then they do have to comply with the energy code. And so there is a, a maximum U-factor requirement. Um, actually, basically what the code says, if you're putting in new windows, it has to meet the prescriptive requirements of the code. So if I'm doing it in climate zone um, 5, for example, my requirements are going to be a point uh, point three two U-factor requirement. If I'm doing it in climate zone 3 or climate zone 2, um, I would have to go ahead and comply with the maximum U-factor requirements and solar heat gain co coefficient requirements for those particular climate zone for the for the window. But again, I can I can put on as much glass as I want to, even though it's an alteration. I can um, because the code currently requires you to have unlimited glazing in your building. So the re-roofing exemption. Um, this is an interesting one because from a from a um, when you read the code. It, which I have reprinted up here, re-roofing for roofs where neither the sheathing nor the insulation is exposed. Uh, roofs without, so basically that means re-roofing a house, which is they're showing on the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, roofs without insulation in the cavity um, where the sheathing or insulation is exposed during re-roofing shall be insulated either above or below the sheathing. So I looked at the ICC commentary, the IECC commentary on this published by ICC, trying to figure out what exactly this meant. And the IECC commentary basically said, applies to roof systems with no roof cavity and continuous insulation installed either above or below the roof system. So the, the example I have down here, here's my roof system. I have a tongue and groove roof deck. Um, if, I, if I tear the insulation off of, or tear the roofing off of this and expose the sheathing and there's no insulation whatsoever in this roof deck, then I would need to go ahead and apply insulation onto the roof deck to meet the code. And so this is how my reading of this commentary, and I suspect others have different readings of the commentary, this is how my reading of the commentary would be. It's not if you, anytime you re-roof a house and you're only taking off the roofing itself, or roof covering itself, which I think the way the code looks at it, um, would I be required to, uh, to insulate others. Otherwise, we're going to have a lot of um, roofers that are also going to be getting into the insulation business for, um, for re-roofing. Um, so anyway, this I'm hoping gets clarified in, in future codes, but uh, I know there's there's something coming into the 2015, and hopefully it'll make it in there. Um, heating and cooling system, we've talked about this a bit um, on past slides. So again, anything you're putting in here has to, to comply that's new. So if I'm adding a larger furnace and controls, I'd need to first do a load calculation, do a uh, manual J load calculation, and then I have to make sure I actually have a setback thermostat on that furnace too. Um, so that would be the requirements on that. For adding cooling system uh, to an existing forced air system, again, I'm going to have to do heating and cooling load calculations on that one. And the line step that goes from the condensing unit to the coil in the furnace is going to have to be insulated for the energy code too. So I have a couple of requirements to comply with on that one um, to, to put that in. Adding a new duct run. Okay, this is going to be um, the requirements on this are going to be based on where the ducts are located. If my ducts are in unconditioned space, then I would have to um, do a duct blaster test or air leakage test on the duct system and also insulate the duct work. If my ducts are being run in conditioned space, the only thing I need to do is seal up the duct work for the, the, uh, the IECC. And, but I would not have to insulate the duct work. So from a duct standpoint, we'll just kind of go through this one more time. Um, insulating, and it, so it, the duct work that's shown in this particular picture, you can see the duct in condition space down here, the large trunk that's being run is not 
insulated, which is fine. It is sealed, which it also needs to be, but it will not have to be tested. You can just on the top of the picture see the duct runs up into the attic assembly, and it is insulated up there. All, that, all of that duct work would also have to be tested uh, to meet the requirements of the code, too. So that, that's how this, this would. Um, so, um, so they're insulated and tested in unconditioned space. They're only sealed in conditioned space. And this is a, this is a key criti critical thing to remember. Service water heating systems. Um, you don't really think about water heating too much in the house if you're adding that from an energy code standpoint, but there are some requirements. So if I'm adding an additional water heater, there's some minimum National Appliance Energy Conservation Act requirements that I have to comply with for the water heater. You probably cannot buy a water heater that does not meet the NACA requirements because they're not supposed to be um, manufactured for sale in the U.S. right now. So that's typically not an issue. Uh, what could be an issue is running new hot water lines to your, uh, your, your sinks and things like that. They will typically have to be insulated underneath the 2012 code to an R3, so you'll need to pay attention to that particular section. If I'm adding a new bath uh, that includes a new water heater, again, my water heater would have to comply with the energy code. I don't have to worry about anything else on that. Um, if I am putting out a circulation loop through my house, and there are some requirements to insulate the entire circulation loop to an R3, and also make sure I have controls on that pump to make sure I'm not pumping water 24 hours a day through the circulation loop, because there's a significant amount of line losses um, to, to go along with pumping that insulation. So you have pump energy and also have um, line loss energy, too. From a lighting system standpoint, it really depends on what you're doing to the building. If I'm, if I'm taking out an old kitchen and replacing it with a new kitchen, which might include new lighting, all of a sudden the efficacy requirements, so high, uh, high efficacy requirements are going to be uh, required for my new lighting system. So that means in my, the space that I'm actually um, uh, renovating or altering, 75% of the lighting must be must comply with this high efficacy re requirement. So if I have lights underneath the counter, for example, um, or underneath the, the, the wall cabinets, um, so maybe I'm putting in some under counter lighting uh, right here. That all counts. If I have pendant lights, which this is showing pendant lights across the bar system, that would count. Um, so again, anything new I'm putting in here, 75% of these lighting must be high efficacy lights. So that will be uh, that will be something to, to make sure from a design standpoint, and also check for from a, from an enforcement standpoint. Same as holds true for bathroom remodels. Again, if I'm putting in new lighting, maybe I'm putting a light bar over the um, over the, the vanity. Uh, the, that's a, a new light, and so theoretically, 75% of the lights in that that space now will have to be high efficacy lighting. All right. Um, so one of the renovations is kind of a fun renovation. Is what do you do um, if you want to keep existing lights? Let's say you want to use old light fixtures and things like that in your house as part of um, part of your alteration or part of your addition. And we were actually able to find a picture of a chandelier that is retrofitted now with uh, compact fluorescence. Um, that would be fine. That would actually comply with the code. That's not our house, but we have one similar to that, and that we actually found that you can get decorative lamps that are uh, shaped like a comp or compact fluorescence that are shaped like the small, uh, the small kind of candelabra lamps that you put into these uh, types of fixtures. It actually looks looks pretty good. Uh, they're not clear, but they do they do you can renovate these. So, and the code basically doesn't require you to use pin based fixtures either. But basically, from a code standpoint, there is. Um, the code basically says it can be a, a screw based a, a screw based type of bulb so it doesn't doesn't define the type of fixture only that it has to be high efficacy lighting so with that i want to summarize and then we'll go ahead and jump into question and answers um, the one thing when you're dealing with additions and alterations to realize is the code is not retroactive. So if you're not touching it, you don't have to comply. This is the energy code. I'm not going to. I don't want to. Don't want to talk about. Um, don't want to talk about the building code, the residential code, and that type of thing. Where I only want to focus on the energy code. Um, there are instances where everything has to be brought up to code. Uh, for example, if I'm moving a, a building, the, uh, the the building codes will require you to, to bring up that building to, to code compliance. From an energy code standpoint, if you're just working on an existing building and you're not planning on moving it, it's only what you are only what you are touching must comply with the code. So again, if I'm running new ductwork from an existing system, only my ductwork has to comply. 
Um, so this is kind of the key thing. So you need to, it's only, only based on what's new. You can look at it in addition as, an, as a, of a new building, and that might be the easiest way to do it um, and not worry about what's in the existing house. You can always bring up your entire building to compliance with the code if you want to. If I'm adding a second floor onto a house, for example, and doing a major renovation downstairs where I'm taking everything down to the studs, then maybe I, I want to do that to get the renovation to the ultra, addition to comply. But um, typically, you know, the easiest thing to do um, is to just look at the addition as a, a standalone building and try to get the addition to comply as, on its own. Converting an unconditioned space to a conditioned space is considered an addition. And this, again, we've had issues and problems with this in trying to deal with, with some of the hard to comply with additions, which is why, um, why, why DOE actually developed the code notes that we talked about earlier. So um, just because a space in your, is in your building or in your house, if it's not conditioned right now, if there's no active conditioning to that space, and you'll have to look at the definitions of conditioned space again, then that could be considered an addition. Um, so even if you want to heat your garage, if I put heating out of my garage, then that's now an addition, and that garage is going to have to comply with the code. And last but not least, compliance is only required for the applicable energy features that are being altered. And this gets back up to my first point as the code is not retroactive. So again, it's only what's being altered, um, only what's new, and that's the key thing as you're working your way through the process. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and open this up to questions. And the first question that I have is regarding installation of air conditioning line sets, does the code require existing line sets to be insulated if they are not being replaced as part of an equipment replacement? Uh, excellent question, and that gets to my point um, in the summary slide that is only what's new has to comply with the energy code. So if I'm only replacing my condensing unit on the outside, I'm keeping the existing line sets and just reconnecting those, I don't have to replace those line sets. Now, Again, I'm a, I, I tend to err on the side of energy efficiency, and my, my general philosophy is if, if you have the opportunity to change something out and, and it's economically feasible to do that, then by all means do it. But there's nothing in the code that would actually require you to insulate, um, insulate or replace the line set just because you're replacing the condensing unit. Okay, so the other question I have, uh, what happens if I just move a water heater or a furnace? So I'm typically, I'm taking, I'm, I'm taking the water heater from one spot or the furnace from one area of the house and moving it to another area. So for example, the addition I showed you on our particular house, we're just if we weren't changing those out and we were technically just moving those to another spot, um, theoretically there's nothing, it's because I'm not purchasing new equipment and not moving new equipment into the house, I could actually move it on the floor to another spot and replumb that. And there would be no requirement to replace that with a higher efficiency boiler, for example, or a NACA a NACA water heater. Um, any new piping I put in there, I might have to go ahead and insulate that new piping. And so if I'm putting in something new to do it, I might have to do it. Or if I'm moving lights around, for example, I have some um, old can lights. I've, I've taken off the ceiling assembly, and I've got some can lights up in my attic, my ceiling, and I'm just moving those lights. I'm not adding anything new to that space. There would be nothing that would trigger the code from that standpoint, because again, I'm not adding additional uh, anything new to it. Um, so. The last question I have here is, can I explain the requirements for high efficacy lighting again? And that's one that I, I think uh, has tripped up a few people. First thing I want to do, though, is probably define what high efficacy lighting means from a code requirement, um, because it's really based, and this is actually in the definition section. I'll just pull out my code right now to, to dig into that. So the code requires. Um, the code actually defines high efficacy lighting as compact fluorescent lamps, T8 or smaller diameter linear fluorescent lamps, or lamps with a minimum efficacy of 60 lumens per watt for lamps over 40 watts and 50 lumens per watt for lamps 15 to 40 watts. So the lumen per lamp um, or, or lumens per watt is just the rating on the um, on, on the, the, the light bulb itself. And the higher the number, the more efficient that particular um, that particular light source is. So if I have a 60 lumens per watt lamp, it means that for every watt of, of power I put in to power that lamp, I get 60 lumens of light out of that. So we want, we want high efficacy. So and then uh, the last one is um, you can actually do 40 lumens per watt for lamps of 15 watts or less. So the small, the very small compact fluorescents and things like that would still need to be at least 40 lumens per watt. So that's, that's the definition of high efficacy. And then the last but not least, we need to look how this was actually going to apply to the code. So if I get into um, section R404, electrical power and lighting systems of the code, 
Um, the code basically says a minimum of 75% of the lamps and permanently installed lighting fixtures shall be high efficacy lamps, or a minimum of 75% of the permanently installed lighting fixtures shall be contained only high efficacy lamps. So I can either count light bulbs or count fixtures. 75% um, of my total number of light bulbs have to be high efficacy in that space, or a minimum of 75% of permanently installed lighting fixtures shall contain only high efficacy lamps. So there's a couple of ways of doing this. There is an exception for low voltage lighting uh, that's not required to utilize high efficacy lamps. Um, so essentially this is, the, so So if I looked at my bathroom, maybe my light over the, uh, my, my light bar over the, the vanity would be required to, um, or maybe I would put my lamps and the overhead lights in the bathroom. A couple of different places I can do it again, as long as I have at least 75% of my lamps as high efficacy lamps. So with that, I see no other questions coming in. So we'll go ahead and sign off. I do want to make you aware of the next, um, the next hot topics will be uh, hot topics in the 2012 Commercial International Energy Conservation Code. That will be coming up in June, on January 3rd, um, same time. Um, thank you very much for spending your time with us, and we hope that um, it was beneficial. Um, if you do have any further questions, you do have our emails. You can go ahead and fire off, uh, fire off questions after the fact, and we will get back to you as soon as possible on this. Um, but with that, I um, appreciate you uh, appreciate you attending, and hope to see you in future webinars. Thanks a lot. Goodbye.